Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kelvin Campbell. I'm chairing today's uh, discussion. Um, I'm a built environment, built environment Fellow for the Royal Commission, and I'm involved in a project fairly similar to one that uh, Judith's involved with, which is effectively how does the planning system deal with this whole question of urban resilience. I also chair um, a fairly large online uh, community uh, called Smart Urbanism, which is looking at exactly this kind of issue. So um, I'm delighted to welcome you all today, today's talk. Uh, just before we begin, a couple of things. Mobile phones off, please, if possible. Is that uh, registered? Okay, because we're going to be um, filming today. In fact, there's a live stream um, over the web. So welcome to all of you who are out there um, watching today. And uh, just a reminder that the hashtag is um, hashtag RSA Rodin, R-O-D-I-N, uh, if you want to get involved in the discussion on Twitter. Um, housekeeping notice is over. Uh, it's a very great pleasure to introduce you to uh, this afternoon's distinguished, uh, distinguished guest speaker, Judith Roden. Thanks, Judith, for coming. Uh, Judith's president of the Rockefeller Foundation, one of the world's leading philanthropic organizations. She's uh, 19 honorary degrees and has participated in many influential global fora, including the World Economic Forum, uh, the Council on Foreign Relations, the Clinton Global Initiative, and the United Nations General Assembly. A pioneer innovator throughout her career, Dr. Roden was the first woman named to lead, leave an Ivy League institution, the University of Pennsylvania, and is the first woman to serve as the Rockefeller Foundation's president. Uh, her latest book, that I've had the privilege of seeing an advanced copy and reading, um, brings together some groundbreaking research and her own expertise to outline how individuals, companies, and societies can avert disaster by creating more dynamic and more resilient cities. Uh, so the format of our, uh, our, our session today is uh, to have a discussion for about 25 minutes uh, to half an hour before we open this up for, for discussion. So with, uh, without further ado, further ado, please join me in welcoming Judith Roden. Thank you, Judith. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Of course. Well, I'm delighted to see you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the book is called The Resilience Dividend, and so I'd like to just spend a few minutes really talking about why resilience and what is the dividend. The idea is really premised on the evidence that crisis may be becoming the new normal, that there isn't a week that goes by that somewhere in the world we don't see something that people would define as a crisis, a cyber attack, a new form of virus, a terrorist attack, a severe weather event, uh, an economic blow, and that we as a global community have been spending billions in a paradigm that is predicated on disaster recovery and repair rather than one that is based on readiness, preparedness, prevention. We can't prevent every disruption. We can't predict every disruption. But we can build a resilient capacity that enables us to prevent every disruption from becoming a disaster. And the book really frames that idea and goes through multiple examples of how that could be accomplished. The dividend um, that brings the title to the book is really the demonstration that these investments not only pay off in how effectively we recover after a crisis hits, or how we recover from the slow burning stresses, which this also addresses, that impair the capacity of an entity to be resilient. Slow burning stresses like inequality and poverty, poor air quality, congestion, uh, and the like. And so how we prepare and get ready for our systems, ourselves as individuals, our cities, our society, our businesses or institutions really determines our capacity to respond more quickly and more effectively and to be able to adapt and grow in the face of stress, to revitalize, to not just build back, whether it's a city or a system or an institution, the way it was before, because that's the element of the vulnerabilities that made us exposed in the first place. So how do we use the crisis or the stressor as an opportunity to rebuild in a way that's more adaptive, revitalize more effectively? 
the dividend is that these investments are not only protective in the bad times, but yield multiple gains for the investments in the good times. Different kinds of jobs, goods and services, new kinds of facilities, new kinds of opportunities. And so the book reviews multiple examples where that dividend pays off. That's critical in a time of, of economic downturns, a time when we all as citizens, governments, leaders are making decisions about how to spend and how to in invest wisely. This argues that you can get more wins for any single investment by framing your investment decisions through a resilience building lens, um, and that's the dividend. Thank you. Um, I don't know if any of you picked up Matthew Taylor's um article in today's RSA. Have you seen it outside? Quite an interesting statement he makes here. He says, the faster things change, the more pr problematic the policymaker's assumption of predictability becomes. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of policymakers in the audience today, and I'm sure there's some questions on that. How do we phrase policy? How do we frame policy in such a way that deals with this issue of resilience? Well, I think that's a wonderful statement, because often policy is made looking in the rearview mirror. So the planning is always, not always, but often responsive to the last thing that happened. And the argument about building resilience is that in preparing more generally for any type of disruption, you can be more responsive specifically to whatever happens. So um, we can't frame policies based on yesterday's crisis, whether that's a, a blow of a weather event or any other kind of low, blow, an economic blow. The goal here is to um, be able to build greater capacity for those things that are somewhat predictable. So if I am planning for uh, San Francisco, I know that I'm at high seismic risk, or Christchurch, New Zealand, or many other places around the world. So clearly, I don't know when it will happen, but I imagine it will, and therefore I'm fortifying both physical infrastructure, soft infrastructure, and indeed social infrastructure, which is a deep part of the capacity of resilience against that risk. But I need to do that build those capacities and that strength in a way that also fortifies me against other kinds of risks. And so whether it's inequality or mudslides or droughts, there are capacities that can be built in, even if seismic is in your mindset, mm -hmm. that make you able to respond better to any disruption. Mm -hmm. Judith, um, I think the book points out the scale of the problem, the scale of some of the issues we deal with. And, um, I'm sort of minded to think that in my professional career, which is probably 35 years, if we project 35 years ahead, we're going to see an increase in urban population from 52% to 75%. And someone said that's the equivalent of 25 megacities of 10 million. It seems a very short space of time. Um, we also know that um, we're told by governments to do more with less, so there's less money around to do these things. How do we, how do we, look, at, how do we look at this future, this uncertain future, in a, in, in a completely different way? And what are the ideas and tools and tactics we use when we start thinking about how we might plan cities, how we might change cities over time? Well, critically, crisis is nothing new. If we look at the, the human history, we know that uh, there have been crises throughout history. What is new is the colliding trends of that rapidly accelerating urbanization the deep impact of climate change and globalization, which is really demonstrating that things that happen in one place have tremendous impact in a variety of places around the world. Certainly, the global economic crisis is one example, but think more locally. When Bangkok flooded, uh, a third of the global supply chains in some uh, uh, businesses were taken down, and so, it is the collision of those three forces and the accelerating pace of change that really make this such a, a critical moment to think about building resilience. In addition, with these rapidly growing cities and, and places that we can't imagine now that will become mega cities, it's estimated that 40% of the infrastructure that will be needed is not currently built. Hmm. 
And so how we build, how we make those investments is going to be critical in determining whether those future cities are more resilient than some of our current cities. Yeah, and that's also, as I said, also within the climate of doing more with less. So yes. the question, how do, you know, how do we do it? I mean, I'm quite interested, whenever we look at, at statistics, we're all faced with these, every presentation we go to, massive graphs that are going up quite quickly and massive graphs that are coming down. And they're generally to do with urbanization and the effectiveness of governance in, 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 in solving these problems. Um, just interested to get your kind of view on any examples out there of where you think things have been done reasonably well. Mm -hmm. uh, let me take an example for each phase of resilience. So the first phase, I think, is preparedness or readiness, uh, as I said, prior to anything happening. And here I can use Boston as a very good example. Boston, for five or six years, was preparing for any kind of event. Mm -hmm. Um, they have severe weather, so hurricanes, storm, terrorism, a variety of events, but all in the same way. They brought together all of their service businesses, power, communications, transit, local government authorities, state and uh, federal government authorities, and a variety of civil society and community leadership as well. And they rehearsed, not for a specific thing happening, but a kind of who's on first if there is some emergency. So they had already decided and practiced that the governor in this case, no matter what the event was, would be the communicator for providing information to the citizens. They had already decided that it would be actually the FBI, no matter what the event was, that would organize the police authorities. And then they used events in the city to practice. So a sports team won a national pennant and there were great crowds and parades and mm -hmm. the like. And they would rehearse all of the things that they might do when there's massive crowds and this kind of, of um, capacity for responsiveness is needed. And so when the Boston Marathon bombings occurred, although a few people died instantly, the evidence showed that everyone who was hurt and not killed had gotten to, was gotten to a hospital within 19 minutes and none of them died. And they attribute that to the absolute practice that they had been doing for anything. So again, they couldn't predict what, but they knew how hmm. once the what occurred. That's the preparedness example. And then there are great examples, uh, which we can go into, of both recovery well and revitalization. Okay, thank you. Um, I was going to just read out, uh, firstly, I mean, the book's for sale. I strongly suggest you buy it. It's, it's pretty incredibly well, well and easily written. I like the sort of blokey way about it. It's got an <laughs> easy language, so we can, all, we can all... For an academic, it's pretty damn brilliant, I'd say. Um, I was going to read one over here, and perhaps you can just expand on it. And this is a, a chap by the name of Holling. Uh, there's a second view of systems. He mentions resilience, therefore, is not about achieving permanent stability of some standard state, but rather about absorbing change and disruption without the system collapsing or be totally thrown out of whack. That's a lovely mm -hmm. um, technical term. Especially in systems that exist with environments subject to a lot of change. Well, that's what we're in, isn't it? So this idea of seeing resilience in a different light, I always thought it was about recovery, getting back to that, that state of equilibrium. It's not in this, in this definition. Absolutely. So we think about stability and equilibrium as being the desired state, but often that is the state that made us vulnerable in the first place. So the logic of this argument is predicated that failing safely is different than failing catastrophically. And so being able to self-regulate and then bounce back in a different way and grow and adapt is absolutely critical. Let's take another city example, Christchurch, New Zealand. It's been, for a couple of years ago, hit year after year, both by earthquakes and aftershocks that effectively raised a large part of the city. And as they thought about how they would rebuild, they intentionally decided that they would rebuild differently, not only physically, which of course is the most obvious since they knew that they were uh, at risk to future earthquakes, but how they would re-knit both the economic and the social fabric of that city. And so they created 
several teams that included citizens, community leaders, business leaders, government officials, and they crafted the various plans for how the housing would recover, where transit would go. So although they relied on experts and policymakers, they produced a more participatory de democracy intentionally as a way of using this as an opportunity of building a different kind of social cohesion. They di are diversifying their economy uh, as a result of this. So they're using the empty lots as more and more vulnerable buildings are taken down to allow more entrepreneurial space, innovation space, artist spaces, and they're seeing a very significant growth in their economy that wasn't there before. We saw the same things in New Orleans mm -hmm. uh, in their revitalization and recovery after Katrina, where, as we know, New Orleans in Katrina was not just a failure, of the levees breaking and the flooding, New Orleans was a social and economic and political failure for many years before. Mm. And so that's how the slow burning stresses mm. make you more vulnerable when the shock occurs. And they have used, it's now 10 years, the rebuilding process to completely transform that city. Mm. They've taken over the entire education system and changed it. Again, they've diversified their economy. They've built different kinds of neighborhoods and fostered community trust and social cohesion that was missing mm. um, before the hurricane. So it's a wonderful story of a city revitalizing and mm. transforming itself. Clearly, it's a work in progress. It's not perfect. Um, but it, it really is a wonderful example of that. And as we see these greater risks, more and more cities and more and more leaders, community leaders, policymakers are going to be called upon mm. to make decisions in how they use their investments and how they frame public policy to allow this kind of, of recovery and vital, revitalization to occur. Thank you. I've got one last question before we open it up to, to the floor for, for discussion. Um, we know we're living in this increasingly complex, local, upside down, uh, informal world. I think I heard a figure the other day that uh, by the time we hit that 2050 mark, I think 60 to 70 percent of the world will be in the informal sector. Um, yet our instruments tend to be quite static instruments. Our planning policies, they tend to be about command and control and complex rules and quite deterministic kind of practices. How do we change mindsets amongst professionals to think differently about how we control the complexity of cities? Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation works extensively in the developing world, and so we have a considerable amount of experience in seeing both the benefits of the informal economies and also clearly the downside. And so much of our system now is predicated on policies for a certain narrative around who is the working population and where do they live and how do they govern themselves or how should they be governed. And as these informal workers, and by the way, I think in the developed world, as we see more independent workers, yeah. workers who Increasing. are not aligned to a particular company or a particular industry, um, we'll see a convergence of policies, <clears throat> excuse me, that make a greater similarity drawn between the creative class, the independent contractor, and the informal sector that we're beginning to see very interesting policy work around. And it is emerging from developing world thinking. Good, thank you very much. Um, there'll be staff uh, with roving microphones on either side of the, the auditorium. At the back there, is that right? Um, so please ask your questions and wait for the microphone. Speak clearly if you can. And, um, directly into it, keeping comments and questions brief, and we'll get to, uh, get to the point. Um, we're trying to wrap up by 2 p.m. today, and um, so let's start. Um, I've got first one over here, and a second one over there. Okay. You've given examples of cities that uh, got it right, Boston, Christchurch. Do you have examples of cities that got it badly wrong? Well, I think New Orleans got it badly wrong until uh, Katrina hit, so that's one very clear example. Uh, I think there are many. We have uh, failures of governance we saw in a variety of places uh, in the uh, Middle East, um, where both cities 
got it wrong. Cairo is, I think, one prime example that was not a, um, a weather shock, that was a social shock. And it didn't, it wasn't able and hadn't planned in a way that allowed it to galvanize the energy around the Arab Spring and turn it into a positive force for a different kind of city and a different kind of society. So there are many examples of, of cities that have gotten it wrong. Um, there are examples of businesses that have gotten it colossally wrong, and some of those are more notable because the evidence is clearer quickly. So a favorite um, example of mine is the yoga pants company, Lululemon, um, which in 2011 had an incredible catastrophe because they found that their yoga pants were completely transparent um, because of the fabric that they were using. And within a very quick period of time, they lost a third of their market cap, their CEO was fired, um, there were sh huge shareholder lawsuits, and the problem was that they lacked redundancy in their supply chain. So they had one manufacturer using one source of fabric, and so when that got taken down, they had no redundancy. So it reminds me that there are, it's important to note that there are five salient characteristics of uh, resilience that are equally evident in resilient people, resilient businesses, resilient cities. Mm -hmm. They are first awareness, that is the ability to take in information in real time and use it, that there are feedback loops and the like. The second is redundancy or diversity. The third is integration, and this is very important for policymakers because we tend to be so siloed in our policy decision making. The fourth characteristic is self-regulation. That is the capacity quickly to de-link from a failing piece if there is a failing piece. Think about grids where one failure can take the whole system down and yet smart switch technology, smart grids allow us to be more environmentally effective by using alternative sources of energy. But it also allows us with smart switches to literally de-link from a failing piece so that it doesn't take a whole system down. And then the fifth capacity, the fifth characteristic <laughs> is adaptability, that you can be nimble, adaptable, that you bend rather than breaking. And that is going back to the Hollings thing, that, mm -hmm. Um, Non-resilient systems are brittle, they're not adaptable. Okay. I was wondering if you'd looked at biological systems as models for resilience. Uh, so in the book I try to look at three sources of um, inspiration for working on this. I am a, psych a biological psychologist by training and all of my mm -hmm. research career at Yale was um, within a large laboratory in, in the area of health and behavior. So I talk both about psychological and biological systems, but also engineering. And it's the three, and looking at both the similarities and the differences among those theoretical frameworks that really enabled uh, me to come up with what I think is the best of them, but also challenge elements of each of them. Hi. Um, Oscar Rodriguez, I'm an architect and I develop urban farms as a way to disintermediate the food supply chain. Um, and I was wondering about the role of disintermediation in those, and I guess another characteristic maybe that could be added to that list, which is directedness, like just shortness of action, no excess, no laxity, just everything is done very directly. Yes, it has the integration, yes, it has the self-regulation and the feedback loops, but Rather than go, what, rather than haymake, mm. why not punch forward? Uh, I, I think that's absolutely critical. I couldn't agree more. And you could think metaphorically about the European rail system. You know, it, railway was terrific until the EU decided to have an EU wide kind of rail system. And since every country still has its own tracks, every country has its own kind of switching and the like. Um, there isn't the integration because it's so vast and the distances, it will happen because there's a lot of work on it. But here's a great example, and of course food supply is another great example, where um, local locality 
will make a difference. It, it will make you more aware. Think of it in the characteristics, though. It allows you to be more aware more quickly because you're, you're there and you can actually see um, what is happening. And it certainly allows you to integrate the critical features that you need to. I think it's a much more adaptable set of systems. So uh, I would argue strongly that it has resilience features. And I think disintermediation is, a, is actually a critical piece of this, not just for the reasons we just talked about, but because I think it allows more bottom-up activity and more bottom-up decision-making. This concept is, is about governance, not just from the top down, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. from the bottom up. Nick? Uh, Nicholas Falk, Herbert. Could you say something about leadership in uh, what you might describe as chaotic cities? Uh, I'm off to Tamil Nadu in southern India <laughs> to speak at a conference uh, uh, where the premier who's committed to world-class cities is now in prison. And it seems to me that quite often the very people who uh, try and provide some leadership uh, are vulnerable to being uh, uh, locked up. Uh, and um, you, 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 you've talked as if people naturally work together. Uh, but uh, certainly the experience in Britain is uh, of, of chaotic uh, Oh, I systems. didn't mean to say that. I meant that building resilience requires that and that that's an intentional thing that one has to develop that may not be um, the natural instinct either of politicians or of others. So um, it's, this is a skill that's developed. Resilience is not an inherited trait and so how you build the capacity to participate, to support one another. We're, we're somewhat cooperative, but not necessarily um, always. And so it is one of the things that absolutely has to be learned and has to be practiced. I would argue for a resilient city, to your example, there have to be four domains that need to be worked on physical and natural infrastructure, and that's critical. The second is leadership and governance, both the kind of governance at the top and all of the other mediating institutions of leadership. The third is the economic system. So how diverse is it? How flexible is it? How fair is it? And then the fourth is the health and social capacity and well-being of the citizens. And unless cities operate to become more resilient in all four domains, they will lack the capacity that will make them ultimately a, a, a better and more resilient city. Hi. Is there a button I press or can I? No, it's working. Yeah, okay, working. thanks. Yeah. Um, vocabulary question, really. Um, you, you seem happy to use the word planning still, but of course the, the idea of planning comes with all sorts of baggage that you were both very interestingly discussing. Um, are you happy to continue using the word planning, or would you secretly prefer us to have a, a different word or a new vocabulary? Um, <laughs> I use the term readiness as the first phase um, in resilience building, and readiness requires planning. So there needs to be intentional planning whether the 20th century urban planning and architectural models are those that will serve us best in the 21st century, I think many people doubt. So, but it's not planning itself, which is the issue. It's how planning occurs and what the new paradigms are for that kind of planning. Yeah, I'd go along with that as well. Right? Yeah. Um, I've got one over here, and then we'll come across to the front over here. I'm Derek Watt. I'm a fellow. I'm over here. Ah, um, if there's to be more urbanization, it means politically the cities become more important. That goes against the grain largely in 20th century politics. Uh, and you wouldn't really expect the United Nations to cope with something like cities or urbanization. So wh where does the citizen go in the city? Because uh, whilst your three examples all had mayors, mm -hmm. uh, we've been a bit reluctant here apart perhaps in London to embrace that kind of thing. But I'm just wondering about the citizen and the city and, and the United Nations not being actually up for the 21st century, but especially with regard to resilient cities. Um, I think where there is strong mayoral responsibility that um, there's a lot of innovation we're seeing on the ground. And so we didn't, we chose 
in the newest initiative that we had, the 100 Resilient Cities Challenge, that we launched in our uh, centennial year of 2013 to especially focus on cities and largely to select cities that had either a really strong municipal authority, whether that person was labeled a mayor or not, um, because the resources were controlled at at least the municipal level. Um, that challenge has really resonated, so we know that there's a lot of action going on on the ground. We've selected 70 cities, London in the last cohort about a month ago, um, but we've had 800 applications from all six continents, uh, 17 languages, that some of which we had to translate and, and, and find help in. So we've asked cities to do three things in their applications, to identify both the chronic slow-burning stresses that they're confronting and also the, the uh, acute shocks that they imagine could befall them to really talk about how the government relates to its citizens, its community leaders, its civil society, and business, and give us very specific and concrete examples. And then to talk about how they would use a, a position that we're funding in each of the cities called a chief resilience officer, whose job will be really to integrate across all sectors of government and government and the rest of the sectors of society. And we are seeing, um, whether it's a mayor or not, tremendous outpouring, both of um, real willingness to, in 800 applications, to talk about the weaknesses and vulnerabilities and what elements of that city are going to be necessary to resolve those problems. So lots of forms of local governance um, in different parts of the world, but local governance is the important key. Right. Go on over here. Hi, I just wondered what you think about most um, definitions of resilience include a disruption um, to happen for change or adaptability. And I wondered in terms of people and communities that live in cities, how you can engage people that haven't um, experienced a crisis to become more prepared and more resilient and how local authorities and governments can build that? Uh, there's absolutely no question that the disruption often galvanizes both the policymakers and the population. My goal in writing this book, and maybe it's, uh, it's too aspirational, is to get people and policy leaders of all kinds, leaders of all kinds, and, and ordinary citizens to recognize that we can't wait, we can't afford to wait anymore for a disruption, that we really, because disruptions are occurring all the time somewhere, and therefore those who prepare for the worst, even if the worst doesn't happen, are going to be the, the ones who are most effective even in the good times. That's the dividend. And we were seeing some traction in that idea. I can't say that um, every city gets it, but 800 cities got it. Um, many businesses really deeply understand that. And um, as this starts to change, we will see more evidence that the investment prior to disruption yielding benefits in the good times really does show people, convince people, that they don't need to wait for the bad times. I'll give you a, a kind of small example, but I think it embodies it. Um, in Hoboken, New Jersey, there's uh, three tremendous needs that they were confronting. Um, the lack of parking space for cars, tremendous flooding, even when there weren't severe storms, and the lack of green recreational space. Now, if they hadn't been thinking through a resilience planning lens, the parks department would have done its planning in one way and the flooding department another, and the third would worry about the car parks. But because they were taking on this framework, they built single edifices, car parks underground, engineered with new Dutch technology that allow them to serve as water overflow tanks during flooding and green recreational space on the top. So one investment, three wins, that's the resilience dividend. 
Um, wouldn't you say that one of the principles of resilience is the ability to turn a threat into an opportunity and to uh, basically turn the energy of the threat uh, against itself or to positive effect as happens in Tai Chi, the energy of the aggressor is mm -hmm. turned against and uh, I don't know if you deal with that. Um, I agree with that completely and I think often to build resilience if we take a vaccination model the the theory of immunization is that you take a little bit of the of the disease and you inject it so that you can build antibodies to it when the bigger onslaught comes. This is exactly the same sort of idea. So often a person or a city or an institution will challenge itself in a more minor relative to a chaotic uh, crisis in a more minor way in order to grow and adapt and transform. Um, we uh, can think of uh, as Juan Close talks about, the, the current head of UN Habitat, when he was mayor of Barcelona, they chose to use the Olympics as a chance, and building for the Olympics, as a chance to stress their theories of urban planning, to stress how their citizens were relating to the government, a variety of things, and so they chose a disruption to build and plan in a quite different way. And I, I think metaphorically, um, that stands for a variety of ways, as you described, uh, that we could think about this. But it, it is an important piece. I've right. got one right at the back and then cross. Um, is it? Yes. Sure. Uh, at the minute, there's quite a lot could of- Could you stand up? Sorry. It would be easier for yeah, me. There's so much light in my <laughs> face. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nessa from City of London. Uh, at the minute, there's quite a lot of discussions that have been happening for a number of, of months now around the refresh of the Hyogo Framework for Action. And the, I, I wanted to kind of check whether you thought that the discussions that are going to happen in Sendai, do they matter? And if they matter, why they matter? If you think they don't matter, why do they not matter? And how can we make them matter? Oh. <laughs> And then tell us about the meaning of life afterwards. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for the tough question. Um, I think this is a very critical year. I think the Sendai convening and the Paris negotiations are, and the end of the Millennium Development Goals and the decision of the global community about what the next goals will be, all coming together in 2015 is quite critical. And so how we emerge from those discussions, whether we can reach global consensus, and how we choose to invest our resources. I started by saying that billions, maybe trillions, are being spent on recovery and repair. Can we, whether it's climate-related issues, inequality, and the like, all of the stresses and shocks that are confronting us now during this era, can we invest some of those resources in planning, preparing, changing the paradigm so that we don't always wait for the bad thing to happen? The Millennium Development Goals showed us that the global community could set goals and various countries in their own ways um, could try to achieve progress along those goals. We need a 21st century set of agreements that could come out of this year um, that will set us on that course for how we invest in the future. Very good. Um, sorry, it's Kilby over there. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Ray, thank you very much for your talk. My name is Kulvia Ranger. I'm a former advisor to the Mayor of London for four years on transport, environment, technology, and I've worked with other cities around the world and also at Imperial College into digital city technology research. Um, you've mentioned a lot about investment. One of the things I found through my experience was the private sector requirement, uh, the greater role of private industries to invest as well as cities and public sector. Uh, and what do you see the role that the private organizations have to play? Predominantly because I found that they were very more siloed than cities are, and how do you see the future with them? Um, I, that is absolutely critical, and so while I said earlier that I saw private sector companies planning for their own resilience, let me use the opportunity of the question to talk about a few examples of, of how I see a broader approach. 
um, SAB Miller, which is a, a large uh, beer brewing company, had an extremely large plant in Bogota. And they found that their water costs were going up quite dramatically. And they were thinking of leaving um, and resettling in another place, which would have been a crisis for the economy of, of that set of communities. Instead, they decided to investigate why the prices were going up. They worked with the water utility, and they found that the reason was that upstream, the uh, uh, dairy farmers were finding it more and more difficult to find grazing land, and so they were clearing more land, and the sediment was going into the river upstream and causing huge expenses for the water utility. What SAB Miller decided to do with the water utility and bringing in the Nature Conservancy was work with the upstream ranchers. They bought higher producing herds for those ranchers that needed less grazing, that were more productive. They taught the ranchers how to protect the ecology of the watershed. And they found within a year that they had dramatically reduced their own water costs. Those costs, water costs also decreased for the local citizens who were reliant on that water utility. The ranchers had better productive herds and the ecology of the river improved. So it's that kind of investment, not corporate responsibility, social responsibility, which is wonderful, um, but is beyond that in what we are seeing businesses do as they become more and more aware both of the importance of integrating um, in their own resilience planning with the communities and then improving the resilience of the communities in which they're located. Thank you. One over here. Hi. Uh, I'm the director of a charity working on road safety in countries of the former Soviet Union, uh, which, by the way, is a, a real sort of disaster happening every day. It's the biggest killer of young people in every world region and it's the fifth biggest killer of adults worldwide now. It's being added to the Sustainable Development Goals, I'm glad to say. Um, the, what I wanted to raise with you, you keep mentioning governance, I'm very happy to hear, and I would say that's number one in, in terms of what you need to, to change. The countries where I work have operated for decades a, a silo mentality of, of governance. Everything is top down. Department of Transport doesn't talk to the police, they don't talk to the road designers, they never talk to communities. And breaking that down is a real battle. We've had some successes in our work, most notably in Moldova, which is a small country. My question to you is really, what is Rockefeller working with some failing cities? Do you have any examples in my part of the world, in post-Soviet space, of cities who are really trying to be champions of resilience. Um, I could go on too about uh, um, natural disasters because mm -hmm. I also am deputy chair of an organization called Fire Aid and we provide humanitarian assistance in terms of fire and emergency services training and relief. And you'd be amazed at what countries who are participating in global discussions about terrorism resilience turn out to only have, for example, in Moldova, eight vehicles capable of extricating someone from a road crash in an entire country of three and a half million people. And when you look at the equipment base that they have, it's just not there. So the gap between those cities and Boston is huge. Um, I'm wondering whether you could comment on that and maybe give me some reasons for hope. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, in the initiative that's most relevant to your question, 100 resilient cities, we've had 800 applicants, some from the part of the world that you describe. But I must confess, relatively few relative to other parts of the world. And so working first to demonstrate this model and what can be achieved by it with those cities where at least there's the recognition of the problem and the willingness to learn new ways to integrate the capacities that you described feels like an important first step for a foundation that although has large resources, does not have vast resources. So our, our strategy is simply predicated on the resources that we have and therefore working with those cities who have chosen to apply, who demonstrate a willingness to be helped, 
to learn, to do things differently. And then we're finding that already, and this is only this particular initiative only 13 months old, um, that the chief resilience officers and the leaders, the mayors in particular of those cities, have become amazing ambassadors for change with other mayors around the world. So we hope that as they get more successes in this kind of integrated model, that they will proselytize and will be able to demonstrate the, the impact, um, the positive income, uh, impact and, and outcomes of this. But um, I, I understand well the question. Okay, one behind and then Oscar. Um, Simon Foxall from The Architect's Practice. Um, you started off, um, this talk um, discussion, so discouraging learning from previous crises and, and finding out how to deal with them. Um, yet one of our most serious problems is our willingness to forget um, what challenges are out there and our failure to reflect properly on, on how to deal with them. Um, we do not um, adequately collect the kind of information that helps us to learn for the next time round. Um, um, could you comment on yes. that? Um, I, if I conveyed that I was discouraging learning from the past crisis, then I misspoke. What I said, I hoped I said, was we can't plan based on the last crisis. We must learn, and that's why I keep emphasizing that resilience is a skill. It can be developed, and it relies tremendously on learning, both from what has already happened and how you're evaluating the successes and failures, the weaknesses in your system and the like. But this is really about learning what is, learning from the last crisis, which allows you to be better at things you might be able to predict more effectively, but also avoiding the unmanageable in how you plan by not just planning based on what you learned from the last crisis. So it's a, it's a building process which doesn't exclude what you learned, but doesn't rely solely on what you last learned. Oscar? Hi. Um, sorry, being greedy with questions. Ah. Um, I'm particularly interested in the quagmire between resilience and climate change. Mm -hmm. That one in particular. I got punched in the eye once in a training accident. Yeah, I was at Wing Chun, I practice martial arts. The next day I met with some Environmental Industries Commission people and we were talking about just the general landscape and they sort of said, well, resilience is going to be the next big thing. Everyone's talking about sustainability before. Now, then it was adaptation, now it's resilience. And those are the three kind of key buzzwords in the whole thing with climate change, right? And obviously I had a black eye, so I was, it was there. It's somewhere in my mind I was thinking about what had happened to me. And I just came out with, well, it's interesting, there's a, maybe a very simple analogy here, which is the fight. Sustainability is lasting the length of the fight. Adaptation is ducking and weaving. Resilience is knowing that you're gonna get hit, getting hit and coming back up again. Now the interesting one is climate change. Because, <laughs> mm -hmm. In a sense, if, you, if we want to take on a war footing, <laughs> we're going to lose because <laughs> we depend upon it. It feeds us. So I was just wondering if you had any thoughts upon that particular sort of you know, image. I can't uh, disavow the assertion that things which matter can sometimes be buzzwords and then start to feel trite or misused. Uh, I think that that often does happen and, and um, there's no real answer for, for that part of it. I would say that sustainability is critical. It is really building a mitigation strategy and banking our resources and protecting. Um, and it is a piece of resilience, but it is not the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And so we take our learning from how much work we do in the developing world, in the climate area. I believe fervently and passionately in working on every possible mitigation and sustainability strategy that you can, and we should. But you can't work in the developing world and watch every day 
the current impact of climate change on drought, on disease, on safety in so many ways, and not believe that you have to also make people and places resilient now against the current environment and the current climate. It's not giving up. It's saying it's a more complicated problem. And so let's focus on the long term and fix that while making the people and economy and social fabric better and more adaptive in the short term. Okay. Across there. Hi, uh, my name's Peter, I'm from Imperial College London. Um, I, uh, I had a question about insurance and those who sort of cost risk for large organizations or cities or whatever. Um, I wonder what they should do in the context of the organizations that they're providing insurance for, for example. Um, if those organizations take a more general approach to, uh, to, to mitigating risks. So rather than having a particular plan for the risk that I'm insuring, they come along and say, well, we're, we're prepared for everything, really. Um, we actually have seen, particularly the reinsurance industry, be extraordinary partners in this effort. First of all, they have extraordinarily good capacity to assess risk, um, at least the known risks, and they can do it in a very sophisticated and quantitative way. Um, but they've been innovators as well. So Swiss Re, for example, has been um, a partner of ours in rural Africa, uh, working on experiments of parametric microinsurance, that is weather indexed insurance for the very poorest of farmers, so that if a weather episode occurs, um, for everyone, the industry doesn't have to go out and examine your individual corn stalk to determine if you were hit, but everybody gets a payout. If, and that's so important for rural farmers, the smallholder, to be able to buy for the next growing system uh, season and feel comfortable in making those investments. That um, integrated with a, a metric now called the Africa Risk Capacity, we've given to, with the World Food Program and Swiss Re, to the African Union, and they're actually now getting the African governments to be part of the reinsurance framework to protect their rural um, smallholder farmers. We've seen the same kind of innovation with uh, cities, where um, although now there's only national catastrophe bonds and only against certain kinds of, of weather um, many of the reinsurers are thinking very creatively about municipal cat bonds in a way that, again, would be parametric <coughs> insurance. We in New York are a pilot for one of the reinsurers, and our transit authority has now sold bonds of about $150 million to the reinsurance um, buyers uh, so that if we get flooded again in our uh, subway tunnels at a certain level, there would be a payout, so again, a parametric insurance product. So exciting. I actually think it's good innovation occurring and, and a more brave sort of experimentation than one might imagine. I think we've got two more to go. I think we've probably to wrap up. Um, I'll see if we've got a bit of time on yours. One, one over here. Yes, Julian Ashmore, fellow. I'm sorry, um, I don't see. Oh, yes, thank yeah. you. Uh, you mentioned inequality three times, but you haven't really talked very much about how you get greater equality. Have you got any advice for us on policy instruments we might be using? Um, I wish I did, and I think we're all sobered by the Oxfam report yesterday um, uh, about the growing inequality and the, the extent of disparity. Um, I don't think there is a single fix, and so I would be naive to suggest policy recommendations. I think that the clarion call is that as we see this worsening climate and the growing disparity and inequality, we are going to need new, in it, just as I talked about the innovation in the insurance industry, we need innovation among policymakers to address this issue. We need to promote that innovation. We need to force as citizens and voters new kinds of policy frameworks. Um, let me add, however, that with that disparity and the shock um, and distress around that, and Rockefeller works with 
intentionally with some of the poorest and most vulnerable communities in the world to try to lift them from poverty and add their voices and their opportunities to a more inclusive economic model. Um, we should also keep our eye on, in the developed world, on the air getting sucked out of the middle class. And so how we evolve these new policy frameworks and how we think in this very low growth environment about the impact on middle class wages and middle class opportunities as we're seeing more and more people slip back who have attained middle class status, the web gets even more intricate and more complicated for uh, the kinds of policy frameworks we should be trying. I think we're going to have to take uh, the last question over there. That, okay, sorry about that. Hello, uh, I'm Peter Guthrie from Cambridge. You mentioned Christchurch in New Zealand, which is one of the best prepared countries in the world for seismic events, and yet the ground accelerations in Christchurch were from an unknown fault and exceeded the design codes which caused the damage. So that there is a question then, how far do you go in going beyond what is known to prepare for events that come your way? Because there must be a limit beyond which investment in resilience is excessive and taking away from the day-to-day -day management of, of urban life. Peter, that's why I keep emphasizing this notion of the resilience dividend. I think two things are true. One it's harder and harder to continue to believe that there's that one in 100 event, the black swan kind of event, whether it's in seismic risk or in the next economic shock. And that's why I started with the assertion that crisis may be the new normal. On the other hand, the idea of the dividend is that you can get multiple wins for that investment. And so you shouldn't just invest the resources for the most extreme risk. You ought to think about planning for the most extreme risk and then working back in what else you can get from making that investment and doing the plan. Um, a very simple example, again, not about seismic risk, but I think it, it makes the point. Um, Boulder, Colorado, which is one of our, our hundred cities, um, has terrible flooding and they started to work on their flooding and they were uh, dramatically flooded in a way that they had never been before. So as they um, recovered, and it is to your point about does it take disruption um, in order for this to happen, and in this instance it did, um, they said, okay, we can't say it's only going to happen every 50 years. We have to adjust to what may be um, the new normal in this circumstance. But they partnered with private developers, and as they built a flood protection system, they built um, culverts that are new transit lanes. They built green sponge absorptive capacity that are, are surrounds new bicycle paths. And they built new kinds of housing that integrated this solution with a very interesting use of the waterway. And so, yes, they made a lot of investment. And yes, they are protected for something and made a big investment. But they, A, brought in the private sector because it was investable, and B, they're getting so many benefits from that single investment. And so I'll end where I started. That's the resilience dividend. So we need to be, be thinking through a resilience framework, but we need to think about how, and, and the capacity to do that is real and available, how we get multiple wins for each investment we make. Thank you very much, Judith. Um, um, minded, minded one quote by an old American activist called Frederick Douglass. He said, it's easier to build strong children than it is to mend broken men. Yes. Um, and I think we spend so much time mending broken men, don't we? I said my whole career has been about fixing mm -hmm. broken men. But I think what's interesting about the book is it deals with both sides of it. I think that's the... And I think it also provides examples. There's some very, very good examples of, of cities and places that have, that have done this sort of thing. So thank you very much thank for you. Uh, an incredible... Um, discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Um.